Welcome everybody to this uh, new uh, seminar of the seminar series, numerical analysis of Galea King in Rome and for Galea King Rome. And today with us, we have Professor Ramon Codina from uh, Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. Uh, forgive me for my pronunciation. <laughs> and today he will talk about stabilization and uh, accuracy in enhancement using artificial neural networks for reduce order models in flow problems. So please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to the organizers. Um, today, my objective is to present uh, part of our work, uh, the work that the, we have been doing in, in reduced total modeling. <laughs> this is a work that right now I'm doing with my colleague, Joan Bages, and a PhD student of us, uh, Zulki Faldar. Although what I will present is also part of the work with, that I did with a former PhD student who is... Uh, Ricardo Reyes. Okay, so this is the, oops, it doesn't work. Anyway, yeah. So this is the outline of the talk. First, I will present the objectives. I will state the variational problem. Uh, I'll talk a bit about model reduction just to fix the, the notation I will use. And then the first part of the talk is uh, contained in section four, which is the variational full order model and reduced order model that we will use. As we will see, these are uh, the same. I will present uh, the results of the numerical analysis that I have been doing um, in the last uh, months about that, uh, which is uh, not fully complete, but nevertheless, I think it's worth to, um, to present the main, the main results. And then I will present the second part of the talk, which is uh, the correction of reduced order models using artificial neural networks, which is uh, <clears throat> an idea that we have um, to correct in general uh, coarse models, not only reduced order models, but in general coarse models, so as to enhance uh, its accuracy. I will show a couple of numerical examples, and, fi and finally I will conclude with uh, some general remarks. So the objectives um, are essentially two. First uh, is to apply the variational multiscale concept to reduced order models in the context of flow problems mainly. I have in mind the uh, Navier-Stokes equations, but in principle it could be applied uh, to other scenarios as well. And the second objective is to introduce a correction based on adaptive neural networks. That's um, uh, uh, the, uh, the application of that correction technique to the case of reduced order models. Why are these two objectives, uh, let's say, of interest? <clears throat> well, first, because uh, reduced order models can be written in a variational form, obviously. They are equivalent to a projection form for linear problems. Um, the construction of the basis is, in fact, irrelevant for the, con for the concept. So uh, we have a variational problem and a discrete variational problem. And the way the basis is constructed doesn't really matter for the concept. Um, once you construct the discrete problem, you may encounter the same instability problems as uh, in the finite element approximations. Uh, so it's important to use uh, techniques in principle similar to those that are used in the finite element context. And concerning the second objective, uh, we have to have in mind that we have some high accuracy solutions from the full order model that will allow us to correct the reduced order model as, uh, as we will see. So first, uh, just a notation that I will use uh, throughout. <clears throat> so I will call Y the space where the continuous problem is posed, that's uh, Y. YH will be the finite element space, the full order model space, YH, which is a subspace of Y. And I will call Y tilde, the space of subgrid scales for the full order model space. Subgrid scales will be the component of the solution that cannot be captured by the finite element mesh or the finite element space in our case. And the same concepts can be applied in the reduced order model case. In particular, the reduced order model space, I will call it YR, and that will be a subspace of the finite element space. I will make extensive use of the fact that the full order model is a finite element model. And I will call a brief Y the space of subgrid scales for the reduced order model. So we have um, these uh, splits that, that uh, are indicated here. So first Y 
can be split as white H plus white tilde. So the space of the finite element space plus the subgrid scales the space for the of, uh, from the finite element space. And the same for the reduced order model space. So this is this Y is equal to YR, the reduced order model space plus brief Y, <clears throat> which is in the space of subgrid case scales for the ROM. Okay. Uh, keeping in mind that uh, the space of uh, the, the ROM space is a, is a subspace of the finite element space, we have that the uh, space of subgrid scales of the full order model is a subspace of the space of subgrid scales of the reduced order model. So I hope it's, it's clear from this uh, picture what, um, what I mean. So let's state the, the variational problem. So I will consider a generic uh, second order differential equation that may arise in, in flow problems that contains uh, a temporal derivative multiplied by a matrix that may depend on the unknown itself. Think, for example, about, I don't know, compressible flows or low Mach number flows or flows in which the coefficient depend on the, the coefficients of the temporal derivative depend on the unknown. And then a semi-linear operator, uh, which is uh, linear with respect to the derivatives, first order derivatives, second order derivatives, and, and zero order derivatives. And maybe the coefficient matrix may depend on the unknown itself. Okay, so this is what happens in the case of uh, fluid mechanics in particular. <clears throat> so this problem has to be supplied with its initial condition, Dirichlet type boundary condition, and Neumann boundary conditions that depend on the operator F, that is the flux operator associated to L. <laughs> and it's of course problem dependent, but in general what we do, in general not always, is uh, to integrate by parts the second order derivatives and have um, uh, components in the flux operator that only depend on the, on the second order term, but we could also integrate by parts the first order term, and this is done in, in, in many, in several occasions. So uh, the problem uh, written in variational form is as follows. Uh, we test the equation with a test function V in principle uh, that does not depend on, on uh, time, but it could depend on time as well. And uh, we define a, a certain duality between the differential operator and that test function. And this is equal to the right hand side. And the same for the initial condition. The initial condition can also be tested against the test function. So in the case of the differential equation I introduced before, the, by, the form B is given here. It's a involving the derivatives uh, represented here by Z, then the test functions V and um, the uh, unknown Y that uh, makes explicit the dependence of the coefficients on, the, on this unknown. So uh, with this notation at hand, we have uh, the variational problem that is written here in blue. We have to find the, the unknown y that satisfies this uh, variational equation. So all this is absolutely standard. <clears throat> and now we, we may go to a few concepts about uh, model reduction. Suppose, uh, in, in particular, our model reduction is based on proper orthogonal decomposition. So suppose that the full order model yields this uh, system of ordinary differential equations, m y dot plus k y equals f. So m would be the matrix coming from the temporal derivative. We assume it to be symmetric and positive definite, as, as usual. And k is an arbitrary matrix, but obviously uh, non-singular. So why, uh, to fix ideas, we may think of why as the array of nodal unknowns of the finite element uh, function, the finite element unknown. So we may think of a Lagrange interpolation, so that why are the nodal unknowns of the unknown function? Um, in this case, uh, I, I, I will consider to simplify the notation that we only have one unknown per node, and therefore this ordinary differential equation is of size and p, the number of points, the number of note of the finite element mesh, but to the extension to different uh, different number of unknowns is, is straightforward. So um, how does uh, POD proceed? Well, we don't know that, but as I said, the fixed notation, um, let me uh, recall it. So uh, by after discretizing and in time, we may collect a series of snapshots that I, will, I call here one, Y1 one up to YS, or capital Y1 up to capital YS, 
And that is the, the, what I will call the matrix of snapshots. The proper orthogonal decomposition, as we know, uh, starts from the idea of performing a singular value decomposition of the matrix of, of snapshots. Here, assuming that the number of points and P is greater than the number of snapshots, we would have uh, this uh, singular value decomposition of the matrix of snapshots. So the idea is to uh, take the left eigenvectors as the basis for the, um, the candidates for the uh, reduced order model space. So that's the idea. So we can, um, suppose, supposing that we have uh, as many as uh, NP, as many as number of nodes uh, uh, left eigenvectors, we can identify each um, array of uh, eigenvectors as a finite element function. So this is an obvious remark that I will make here, but um, is important in the applications. Um, and in fact, the title of this slide is this is about POD orthogonality. So what do we have to understand as POD orthogonality? So when we uh, uh, perform the SBD decomposition of the matrix of uh, snapshots, we get arrays, vectors of NP, uh, R and P. But we may identify them as finite element functions simply by considering that these uh, components are the nodal values I said at the beginning that we can understand, we can assume that we have a Lagrange interpolation, for instance. So we may understand these arrays as the nodal values of a certain basis functions little uh, phi uh, here with the superscript i to indicate that we have um, as many as n p of them, and those nodal values are multiplied by the standard interpolations functions of the finite element uh, approximation n a, also called shape functions. And therefore, we can associate to the array capital phi a function, finite element function, little phi. Okay. Uh, we know also that the standard SVD singular value decomposition routines yield um, the left eigenvectors that are orthogonal, orthonormal, in fact. That means that uh, the matrix of uh, left eigenvectors will satisfy this orthogonality property written here in blue. However, this is not what we need. And we have found very important, we have found crucial in our applications to make sure that what are, uh, that the orthogonality holds in the L2 sense for the basis functions little phi, not for the arrays phi. Well, this is uh, very easy to achieve. We just have to uh, call the SVD routines, not with the matrix of a snapshots Y, but with this matrix, uh, uh, hat y that is just the matrix m to the power of one half multiplied by the matrix of a snapshots. So it's a sort of a scaled um, matrix of a snapshots. And and once uh, we receive the matrix um, the matrix from the S, uh, SVD routine hat phi, we recover our matrix phi simply by multiplying by m minus one half. So M is usually the mass matrix. M is usually mass matrix, or in our application, just the mass matrix. And to perform these operations, it's very important to, that it is symmetric and positive definite. And this is not a trivial observation because in some methods, it is not symmetric. For example, in residual-based stabilized methods, when you put the whole residual, if you also put in the residual the approximation to the temporal derivative, the matrix M is not symmetric. <laughs> OK, so another easy uh, observation, but that this is also important for what follows. So with this construction, we, we have uh, the, the full order model space. And we construct the reduced order model space just by keeping the first uh, R with R much smaller than NP um, eigenvectors or eigenfunctions the first uh, uh, R components of the basis. So we have that uh, a function in the finite element space can be expressed as usual as a linear combination combination of the basis functions A multiplied by the nodal unknowns, Y, Y A here. Uh, and likewise, the a function in the reduced order model space is a linear combination of the basis functions. So we have that it is equal to this uh, little phi multiplied by alpha, the coefficients of the expansion. 
summing from i equal one to the number of, uh, to the dimension of the reduced or removable space. In turn, this function phi, little phi, can be expressed uh, as a linear combination of the finite element basis and the coefficients arising from the SBD decomposition, the arrays that we called capital phi and that multiplied by the coefficients of the expansion alpha. And rearranging this sum, we see that the any function in the finite, in the reduced order model space is a linear combination of the finite element functions, so the full order model basis, multiplying by coefficients, that by the coefficients of the reduced order function, which are precisely the basis that we have taken multiplied by the coefficients of the reduced order model expansion. So again, this is a trivial observation, but will be important for, uh, uh, will be important later on. So here, uh, phi bus r means uh, the basis, the, the basis truncated uh, to the rth component, which means that the reduced order model space is assumed to have uh, dimension little r. Okay, so everything that I have said so far is absolutely standard. And now uh, we can move to the variational formulation we propose for the ROM that can be summarized very, very easily. For the ROM, we propose exactly the same formulation that we do for the form, for the full order model. And let me uh, summarize uh, how is this uh, formulation. So we base our approach on the so-called variational multi-scale concept developed by, by Hughes in, in, in the first paper in 1995, so um, uh, almost 30 years ago. And, um, and the idea is uh, very simple. The idea is that we split, uh, as we saw at the beginning, the continuous space into a finite element space YH and the space of split scales Y tilde. Okay, so I will detail a bit uh, the model for the full order model. And uh, then in the reduced order model, I, I, the, the description is very simple. I will just say that we use the same variational formulation. So according to the splitting of the space, we can split the unknown into the finite element component YH and the sub and the sub scale Y tilde, and likewise for the test function. And then we can unfold the original problem into two equations, which are exactly equivalent, no approximations at all, to the original one. And these two equations are written here. So in the first term, you see that, um, well, first of all, uh, for, the non, for the dependence of the coefficient with respect to the unknown, I have left y as it is. So y, this uh, y is written in red here, is y h plus uh, y tilde. I will make a comment on how to approximate that later. Then the temporal derivative is split into the temporal derivative of the finite element component plus the temporal derivative of the separate scale. So the semi-linear form B, once Y is fixed, is linear in the, two in the last two arguments. So we can split uh, um, the second uh, argument into YH plus Y tilde and have the two terms that we have uh, here. And the first uh, equation, as you see, is tested against functions in the finite element space. And then the second equation is exactly the same, exactly the same terms, but with the test function in the uh, space of subgrade scales. So all that is very well known, but uh, it's uh, worth to repeat that um, because we will apply this exactly uh, for the reduced order model problem. So now um, we have to operate here. The idea is that we will approximate uh, Y tilde, but we do not want to approximate derivatives of Y tilde. And what we do is we integrate by parts the terms that involve derivatives of Y tilde. That's essentially what we do. And for that, it is uh, useful to introduce the formula joint of the operator L, which is uh, written here in the case of the operator introduced at the beginning. So we have the second order term, the first order term, and the uh, zero order term. We can also introduce the uh, uh, joint of the flux operator. <laughs> this is not as standard as, as uh, L star, but it's very useful. And then we can introduce, introduce what I will call the finite element residual, which is the right-hand side minus the differential operator applied to the finite element function. 
And again, I always keep uh, the coefficient dependency on y explicit. So that's why m here depends on y. And I also write the dependence on the of the coefficients on y in explicit way. So these two equations are exactly equivalent to the original problem. And with these definitions and after integration by parts, what we get is this. Again, this is exact. There are no approximations here. So the only thing uh, I've done is to integrate by parts the terms that involve derivatives of y tilde, so as to have that isolated without any derivative, and then we will approximate directly y tilde and not uh, its derivatives. So when we move derivatives of y tilde to the test function, we get the adjoint here. This is, again, exact, no approximation. This is applicable for nonlinear problems because I have kept the nonlinear dependence on the adjoint as well. Uh, the same for the fluxes, the fluxes on the element boundaries. And for the second equation, the equation that is tested against, against uh, test functions in the scale, uh, scale space, um, I, I simply go back to the, original, to the original equation. So I allow testing the taking derivatives of y tilde because this is what we will approximate, okay? And then the essential approximation is that in the equation tested uh, against functions in the circuit space, we simply replace the whole operator uh, L by uh, a matrix, in the case of uh, uh, more than one degree of freedom, uh, by a matrix multiplying the circuit scales. So in, a, in essence, what we do is we transform the partial differential equation associated to the circuit scales to an ordinary differential equation in time, because we still have temporal derivative in time okay and this is true up to any function that belongs uh, that is such that uh, when tested with uh, functions in the finite element space this uh, uh, v tilde ort orthogonal is a zero so functions that satisfy this property anyway in summary what uh, the second equation implies this second equation implies is that up to values on the boundary we have this ordinary differential equation where the when where this uh, pi tilde stands for the projection onto the finite element space. So this is where the, where the approximation has been made in this equation, okay? And now we have several options that we have uh, explored uh, uh, over the years, which are the following. First, if pi is the identity on residuals, um, so that means that the finite element, the, the space of subtilis scales is, is, um, is the space of finite element residuals, we call the resulting approximation algebraic circuit scales. Uh, we favor the case in which pi is the projection orthogonal to the finite element space. This is uh, in general very useful, it works very well, and in the context of reduced order models is very, very natural, very natural and works, works uh, very well. We call the resulting formulation as uh, the resulting method as orthogonal circuit scales. Then uh, I have always kept the temporal derivative of the circuit scales, but in, in most of the literature, you will see that this is neglected. So if, we, if you neglect the temporal derivative of the circuit scales, we call the, the circuit scales quasi-static, and if not, we call them dynamic. And then what about the dependence of the coefficients on y? Uh, well, once you integrate this equation, you can you could uh, approximate iteratively the circuit scales and evaluate them also in the coefficient matrices. If you don't, we call the circuit scales linear, and if you do, we call them nonlinear. Um, that has uh, a certain interest in the case of turbulence, but uh, in what follows, I will assume linear circuit scales. That means that the coefficient matrices will be approximated by the finite element function and not by the whole unknown y, so only by yh. So this is the final foam, foam problem. Uh, on the boundaries of the elements, I will assume that y tilde is zero, that can be relaxed. In fact, uh, we have uh, also worked on what we call the scales on the element boundaries. But in, here I will assume that the scales are zero on the element boundaries, and this is the final one. And noting that uh, for orthogonal subtilis sub scales, this product is a zero because the space of subscales is orthogonal to the finite element space, the final method is what is written in, in this box. 
So we have in black, or in the first equation in black, we have the Golurkin terms, and we have a stabilizing term that are the separate scales multiplied by the adjoint of the differential equation applied to the test function. And as you see now in the, in the uh, argument that indicates the dependence of the coefficient matrix on the unknown, I have used YH and not Y, because as I said, we are using linear separate scales here. So YH needs to be computed from the second equation that is, as I said, an evolution equation. So in principle, the separate scales have to be updated in, in time unless you neglect their time derivative. For those of you familiar with concepts in solid mechanics, in our case, the separate scale, scales act a little bit as um, internal functions of the model. So we have to uh, keep updating them uh, in the process. So the description of the reduced order model is very simple. So the reduced order model is uh, the reduced order uh, model space, the ROM space is simply um, obtained by keeping the first R modes of the left eigen, eigen functions resulting from the SVD decomposition. And now we do exactly the same process as before. We also define the space of uh, subdivided scales for the ROM, which is this brief for Y. <clears throat> and we apply exactly the same concepts and we apply exactly to the same um, form of the discrete problem. <clears throat> So here, uh, it is important to note that uh, we have made use of the fact that the full order model is a finite element model and uh, the element bases are piecewise polynomials. For example, this is important in the error analysis. We may use, uh, for instance, the standard inverse estimates that are uh, crucial in the error analysis and the stability analysis as for, for the finite element method because piecewise they are exactly finite element functions. And in particular, we also use the same stabilization parameters <laughs> that can be just um, for the form and for the ROM. So these tau's are the same as before. Let me make a couple of remarks. First is about the importance of orthogonal separate scales. Uh, it, it's, it's very simple. If we have orthogonal separate scales, we can have an explicit representation of a space uh, brief uh, Y, which is the space of subgrid scales for the ROM model. Why? Because if, y, if brief Y is orthogonal to uh, YR, the representation we have is this one written here. Remember that the uh, basis functions are already orthogonal. Therefore, the orthogonal to the space YR is the space is spanned by the functions that we have uh, left aside plus the orthogonal to the finite element space. And that is precisely the orthogonal to the finite element space is precisely the space of separate scales uh, tilde y. Okay. So this is the first uh, remark. We have that explicit representation in the case of using orthogonal separate scales. Uh, the second remark is that since we are using the same a method for the, the same variational multiscale method for the ROM and for the FOM, if the FOM system uh, has this expression, where delta T is an approximation to the temporal derivative, then the ROM system has this structure where matrix um, MR is nothing but the projection of matrix M onto the ROM space, and likewise for matrix K, KR, and also for the forcing term. Because, as we saw at the beginning, I, I said it was a trivial observation, but it's useful. The uh, un nodal unknowns of the reduced order uh, function are nothing but the basis functions multiplied by the coefficients of the expansion. So, uh, only when we have exactly the same numerical model for the full order model and for the reduced order model, we have this property, which can be understood as a Galerkin projection. <laughs> yes, and, and that, that in fact brings me to the next comment, which is about uh, petrov lurking projections. So from the previous remark, if we have uh, an algebraic system AY equals B for the full order model, the algebraic system that uh, we have for the reduced order model is AR alpha R equals BR. 
Uh, when I say the final algebraic system, I mean after discretizing in time as well, of course. So uh, we have talked about the space discretization, but now um, we consider also the uh, time discretization. And the case of uh, in, in which uh, both uh, the reduced order model and the full order model have the same, I insist on that, the same numerical method, the same variational formulation, then matrix AR is nothing but the Galerkin projection of matrix A, and likewise for the right-hand side of B. So as uh, I was just saying, this can be understood as a Galerkin projection. So that means that uh, if the variational multiscale reduced order model is equal to the variational multiscale uh, full order model, we have a Galerkin projection and vice versa. Vice versa. This is uh, nice, this is clean, but <laughs> in nonlinear problems, we have seen that uh, we have observed uh, since, uh, since our original work on that, and also very recently we have, uh, we have uh, strong experiments uh, supporting this fact, we have found that the nonlinear convergence of the petrov golerkin projection defined here is much more robust than the uh, golerkin projection, which is the petrov golerkin projection that we use. So it's simply, instead of multiplying by the left, by uh, five transpose, we first multiply by a transpose and then by five transpose. So you can under, you can think of this as a petrov golerkin projection in which uh, the, let me call them test functions, are not the basis functions, but a multiplied by the basis functions. Uh, the reason why this is uh, much more robust, uh, we really don't know. So this is a question I, I posed uh, to Trajan in, in the talk he gave in the first day of these uh, seminars. And I, I, don't, I don't know the explanation for that. Of course, for linear problems, the solution is the same. When you have a linear problem, it doesn't matter whether you have a, a petrov golerkin or a Petrov or, or a Galerkin projection. But for nonlinear problems, um, the situation is different. And we have um, recent examples supporting this fact. Well, let me summarize a bit uh, the results that uh, we have uh, for the convergence analysis of the method uh, that of the, this variational formulation of the reduced order model that we propose. And I'll do that for the simplest case. That means the transient convection diffusion equation that is uh, written here. So this is the formulation that I will consider. So it's, uh, it's a simplified form of the, previous, uh, of the previous general expression. So um, simplifying in what sense? Well, first of all, I have considered uh, that uh, T is the time interval of analysis. Uh, so delta T here is dimensionless. It doesn't have uh, units. Um, now the stabilization terms in this particular case can be reduced to, to this form. So the orthogonal projection of the, pro of the convective term multiplied by the convective term applied to the uh, test function. Uh, the stabilization parameter that we use is, is written here. So that's the dependent with the dependence with uh, h. So we have h squared with the, for um, dividing the viscous term and h dividing the velocity. And these constants, in fact, have to scale as the polynomial order to the power of four, not two, but four for the viscous term and the polynomial for the convective term. So this is the expression of the stabilization parameters that, that we use. And this, by the way, the model, again, is uh, the same, exactly the same for the ROM and for the foam. So the idea now is to analyze the foam. And also, let me remark, let me stress that we use H. Here, H is the size of the finite elements. And uh, we use this expression for the uh, ROM problem, for the reduced order model problem. So uh, I like to analyze time dependent, problem, time dependent problems using a variational formalism. Perhaps it's not uh, very common, but uh, I think it's, it's useful. And the idea is uh, to write the time dependent problem as a sort of variational problem where the unknown is not a function, but a sequence of functions, capital UR. Um, so I can, the, the original problem can be written as this sort of variational problem where B is defined here. So we have, uh, in fact, the only thing that you have to do is to add up for all the uh, time steps to end up with this uh, expression. 
And also the initial conditions are imposed uh, in a weak form. So this uh, form little b is the form that are, the bilinear form, bilinear in this case, that arises from the space approximation and has a contribution from the viscous term, a contribution from convection, and of course the stabilizing term. So we can define two norms. One is what I call here uh, the weak norm, which essentially is the L infinity L2 norm. So L2 norm is squared, of course. The norm that comes from the Galerkin term, which is viscosity multiplied by the gradient squared, and, uh, sort of L2, L2, uh, L2H1 norm. And then we have the norm coming from the stabilization term. And we can have, if we put the orthogonal projection here, this is uh, rather weak because we don't control the whole convective term, but only the orthogonal component of it. But we put also, we can also define the strong norm in which we, we control the whole convective term. And of course, the important thing is to obtain uh, results involving the strong norm and not the weak norm. So, <laughs> Uh, for the see here, I have assumed that we are using quasi-static circuit scales, and for quasi-static circuit scales, we need this assumption that that tau is small enough, or if you wish, delta t is large enough, which is sort of uh, strange. Uh, when you use dynamic circuit scales, you don't need that assumption. So, in the weak norm, we can prove very easily coercivity. And in the strong norm, we cannot prove coercivity, but we can prove an in subcondition that is enough to prove optimal convergence. That is what is uh, written here, strong convergence. So if we look at the error estimate that uh, can be proved, the last uh, result, uh, it is easily seen that in this case, this error is order delta t in time because uh, we have started from a first order time approximation. But what remains open is to see the estimates of the approximation, because that relies on the approximation of the reduced order model space uh, to the uh, space of the continuous problem. Uh, that is not as easy as in the finite Alman context, because uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, you know that the estimates, for example, in L2 depend on the eigenvalues or the generalized eigenvalues that we have left aside. So the sum of the squares of the eigenvalues that we have left aside is the square of the error in L2. But um, we have to use also other norms. For example, if we look at the expression of the strong form, it's okay, we have the L2 norm, but we also have the L2 norm of the gradient of P and the L2 norm of the convective term multiplied by a parameter that depends on H. So in a sense, this error estimate is optimal, but what, is, um, what needs to be worked uh, further is the expression of this interpolation error um, for the reduced order model space, okay. Well, the same can be do for second order schemes in, in time. So I will go directly to the final result. And the final result states that we also have an optimal error estimate for uh, the second order scheme in time. Uh, the only difference is that we have to have estimates not only for the difference between the unknown U and the reduced order model component VR, but also for increments of, so differences between two components uh, of the unknown U and uh, the possibly best approximation to U in the reduced order model space. So I, I will skip that. So in summary, um, it is possible to you to uh, using exactly the same ROM model as the form, one can prove uh, uh, stability and convergence uh, essentially, one of the keys is that, as I said that, uh, before, we can use inverse estimates, which are uh, crucial to prove stability and from them uh, convergence. And the reason why you can prove uh, inverse estimates is because the wrong functions are, in fact, finite element functions and therefore piecewise polynomial. Well, you can also use a similar argument to. Uh, propose uh, a posteriori error estimates because our proposal in this field is to take the uh, um, a posteriori error estimate as a certain norm of the circuit scales and that can be done for the full order model and also for the reduced order model. We exploit that in, in a paper that we published a couple of uh, years ago. 
Okay, so that's uh, the end of the first part. So the variational reduced order model and the, um, which is essentially is very easily summarized. It's the same as the full order model. And now let me go to the second part, which is the correction of the reduced order model using artificial neural networks. So the idea, in fact, can be applied to any course model. And what um, I will do here is to explain the idea uh, in a general setting. So suppose that we have a course problem, uh, linear, for example, of the form AUC equals F. So we have a, a problem of size little m that we have to solve. But that corresponds to a course version of, a, of another fine problem, what I will call a fine problem, for which we have the fine solution UF, okay, of size uh, capital M, which is larger than little m. For example, in the case uh, of reduced order model problems, uh, little m would be the size of the reduced order model space, and capital M would be the size of the finite element model, the full order model um, that we have. And uh, we have also, we have to have at our disposal a projection, sort of projection from the fine problem to the reduced problem, to the coarse problem. So this projection is P here. So now we state the basic assumption and is that we consider that the best core solution, the best we could hope for, for the core solution is that this is equal to the projection of the fine solution, okay? So of course that uh, assumes that this projection is uh, accurate enough. For so we assume that the best core solution is the projection of the fats of the fine solution. Of course, if we have the fine solution, we could modify the original problem to this uh, equation that is written here, so that we add a correcting term D and this correcting term uh, can be uh, computed exactly in the case of one solution and is nothing but F minus A matrix A multiplied by the projection of the fine solution. If we put this D in this modified equation, we obviously obtain that the solution UC is the projection of UF, okay? So that's what I say here. For a single solve, uh, that correction is, is unnecessary as we already have the fine solution. However, we are interested in, in what uh, I call here different configurations. And what does, mean a confi what does a configuration mean? So it means a problem that is slightly different to the original one, because maybe the boundary conditions have changed, because the forcing terms have changed, because the physical properties have changed, or above all, because we are stepping in time. So uh, maybe we have the solution at certain time steps, but not for all time steps. So now let's assume that we have N configurations, capital N configurations, for which we know the fine solution, UFI, with i running from one to n. Now, uh, for these configurations, we could also define the exact correct, correcting term that is defined here as dxi. So it's nothing but fi, the forcing term at the configuration i, minus matrix I, ai, which is the matrix at the ith configuration, multiplied by the projection of the fine solution at configuration i. And therefore the solution to this uh, corrected system would be the projection of the fine solution. This is absolutely obvious. But now we make our main modeling assumption. So now suppose that we want to solve the problem for a case for a configuration in which we don't have the fine solution. So we have another configuration, maybe another time step in which we don't have the uh, exact, so the fine, so not exact, the fine solution. Then our modeling assumption, assumption is that we introduce a correcting term that is a function of the course solution. And that function is designed under the condition that it is as close as possible to the exact correction at the configurations in which uh, the fine solution is known. Okay, so we know the, the exact correction at certain instances at certain configurations, and then we design a correcting term so that it is as close as possible to the exact correction at the configurations in which we know the exact solution. 
So this can be implemented essentially, or we have, we have explored the implementation of this idea using two methods. One is a simple list of squares approach. In this list, list of squares approach, the correcting term is a linear function. So uh, the model for the correction is the linear one. So D is a matrix A multiply A D multiplying the unknown U uh, course, which is the unknown that we are seeking, plus the forcing term. And that and then these matrices A D and F D are obtained, are computed from an optimization problem so that the difference between the exact correction and the approximated correction at the point, at the configurations in which we know the fine solution is minimum in a list of square sense. So we, uh, AD and FD are the arguments of the minimization problem written here. The exact correction minus the, project, the correction, of course, evaluated with the best solution that we have at our disposal, which is the projection of the fine solution. This approach works, although it suffers from typical instabilities of least squares approximations, which essentially, I mean, rather than instabilities, the problem is that when we add a new uh, configuration, a new known configuration, we have to redo all the process. And uh, this, uh, that uh, it might change a lot from, from knowing n configurations to knowing n plus one. This is the typical problem of uh, least square approximations. So the alternative is uh, to reduce an artificial neural network. So what is the idea? The idea is that we construct this function D of U, um, component wise, by the way, and using for it a linear, an, uh, an artificial neural network. As simple as that. So, what is uh, what? What do we do? So, the output of the neural network will be, of course, the components of the correcting term u that depends. Remember, depends on the core solution. That's the input. Uh, in the applications, we don't need to put the whole input when we want to compute the an output. Uh, why? Because a, a, a node, so imagine we are in a, in a discrete context, for example, in, a, in the coarsening of a mesh, because that can be applied not only to reduced order models, but also to coarsening of meshes, for example. And in fact, the first paper we wrote was about coarsening of meshes. So <laughs> each node, for example, the correction for each node depends essentially on the surrounding nodes. So we don't have to put all the array UC um to to obtain the neural i mean to, uh, to construct the neural network for the correction at the jth point but only the uh, components of you of the nodes sur surrounding or close to uh, the jth node okay so the, in principle the input is the whole vector of uh, of uh, unknowns you see but as i said it can be simplified so what is the last function, the function that we want to optimize? So the neural network is, optim is constructed by optimizing a loss function, and the loss function is the same as for the least square approximations. Approximation, it is the difference in a least square sense between the exact correction that we know and the correction predicted by the neural network in this case. So what does that mean? It means that we are using a training using the language of neural networks, the training set are precisely the projection of the fuller defined solutions at the configurations in which we have these uh, fine solutions. So at, at certain configurations from i equals one to n, we have the five defined solution, we project it, and we construct the function d, such which is a, a neural network, such that the difference between the exact correction and the modeled one is minimum in this uh, list of square sense, but for you constructing um, function D from a neural network. Uh, some remarks. So the output is a highly nonlinear function. Um, therefore, if we put that uh, correction in the original equation, we have to linearize it. The way we have explored is simply to evaluate that with values of U in the previous iteration although we could use also, for example, a newton raphson iteration as well. Uh, another remark is that it is irrelevant to know which is the problem for the fine solutions. The fact is that we have the fine solutions at hand, but the problem for them is, is, 
is irrelevant. And also final remark is that uh, since we don't want to, uh, let's say, explore much the, uh, the use of uh, artificial neural networks, we have used uh, relatively shallow neural networks in our applications. So if we apply this idea to the context of reduced order models, what we have to do is what it is explained here. So suppose we have this ordinary differential equation for the full order model, my dot plus ky equals f, and this differential equation for the reduced order model, which has the same structure because it's just the Galerkin projection, as I said uh, before. So what do we do? Uh, to the once we discretize in time, we have uh, an algebraic problem that is uh, corresponds to the to the terms written in blue here, and we add a correction, and we add a correction which is this function d that depends on the coefficients alpha, the unknown coefficients alpha themselves. So it's a it's a nonlinear function that depends on depends on the solution, and as I said before, it has to be linearized. What is the key point? The key point is that in the case of reduced order model, the configurations, <laughs> the configurations for which we know the exact solution, so this i from one to n, are precisely the snapshots that we have used to construct the reduced order model. So in a sense, we are reusing the snapshots in this model. So we first used the snapshots to construct the basis of the reduced order model space. And now we are reusing the snapshots to design the correcting term. And the way we uh, use these snapshots is by, by imposing that the, the reduced order model solution is as close as possible to the projection of the full order model solution at the time instance in which we have the snapshots. So this is a general idea. In fact, in the in the reduced order model context, we have uh, recently uh, submitted or recently we have submitted a paper in which the implementation of this idea is uh, slightly different, but the, the the concepts are the same. And the implementation differs a, little, a bit, but the concepts are the same. And we have also applied this idea to uh, coarsening of finite element meshes or coarsening in time. So uh, coarsening solutions in time, but uh, then correcting the coarse model to improve its, its accuracy. So let me show a couple of numerical examples, very simple, just to uh, show what type of improvement do we get. And we are quite satisfied with the results that we are obtaining so far. Well, first of all, we are applying that to the Navier-Stokes equation. So this is the particular realization of, uh, of uh, the operators that have been introduced to the Navier-Stokes equations. And then let me show the, <coughs> the first model, which is the flow over a backward facing step at the Reynolds number of 40,000, which is quite high for this problem. And we have a, a quite complex dynamics. So on the left, you see the contours of the velocity field and on the right, the contours of the pressure. And I will show uh, results of the uh, time evolution at a certain point that is right after the step. So we pick a point right after the step and we plot the evolution of the pressure and the velocity magnitude, the velocity norm in time. And we will compare three results. We will compare what happens with the full order model so the finite element solution, doesn't matter what it is, just a finite element solution. Then the reduced order model solution with uh, dimension seven and dimension 26, as you see here in this particular case, and then the corrected reduced order model solution. And this is what we get. So this is the evolution on the top. You see the results for uh, R equal seven. On the bottom, you see the results for R equal 26. On the left, you see the pressure evolution, and on the right, you see the evolution of the velocity magnitude. So these results correspond to the temporal evolution within the training interval. That means that we had snapshots between zero and 50 uh, time units, and we are computing the solution at different time steps um, using the correction that we have introduced or not. So you see, from especially from the pictures on the top that correspond to R equals seven, so the, to the poor ROM model, let's say, 
that we have uh, the evolution of pressure or velocity for the full order model, FOM, which is in blue. Then we have the, the, the solution of the original uncorrected reduced order model that is in yellow. I hope you see them, that, that solution. And then in the middle, you have the solution of the corrected reduced order model the co using the correction that I have just uh, described. And you see that the solution of the correction is not perfect, but much closer to the full order model solution than the uncorrected reduced order model. And that happens both for both the pressure and the velocity. Of course, if you increase the dimension of the reduced order model space from 7 to 26, then the improvement is not that apparent, but it's still there. This is what happens what happened when you uh, plot the evolution within the training interval. So that means that the snapshots were taken between 0 and 50. But if you go outside the training interval, the situation is, is much more pronounced, significantly more pronounced. If you look at the pictures on the bottom, which is again that temporal evolution, in the left, you see the pressure evolution, and on the right, you see the, the evolution of the velocity magnitude. You see that uh, the uncorrected ROM is departing quite significantly from the form, and in fact, it seems to be even unstable, whereas the corrected ROM keeps quite close to the full order model solution. And this is true for both pressures and velocities. Uh, this is not a matter of a single point of a matter of a single component of the decomposition, but in fact, if you plot the, plot the whole spectrum of uh, uh, pressures on the left and velocities on the right, you see that that pressure spectrum is much better approximated using the corrected ROM than the uncorrected ROM. Again, yellow means the uncorrected ROM, um, blue means the full order model, an orange or this red or between red and orange is the corrected drum. We have a closer spectrum using the corrected drum, both in velocities and in pressures. Even in the worst case, which is the tail of the uh, spectrum for the uh, velocities, the error is uh, the error in the drum is half the error of the uncorrected ROM. So the error of the corrected ROM is half the error of the uncorrected ROM in logarithmic scale. So it's quite, quite significant. So uh, another example here is the flow over uh, uh, this um, configuration of, of three cylinders at the Reynolds number of 1,000. Again, the dynamics is uh, quite complex, the dynamics of this uh, simple example. And I will show results here with the dimension of the reduced order model equal to 20. And we observe the same trend as before, exactly the same trend as before. So on the left, we have uh, pressure. On the right, we have uh, velocity. On the top, we have the evolution at the point. On the bottom, you, we have uh, the spectra of both pressure and velocities. And you see again that the solution obtained with the uh, corrected form, uh, ROM, sorry, the corrected reduced order model is much closer, significantly closer to the solution obtained with the full order model than with the uncorrected uh, ROM, okay? And that is essentially it. So let me conclude with uh, some uh, remarks. Uh, the first one is that uh, we have we used the same uh, formulation for the reduced order model and for the uh, full order model. That means that we are using a in projection of the full order model. So uh, and this, this observation is in fact important for, uh, for us because uh, the, the scales in the Roman space do not necessarily belong to the full order model space. This is important for us because in our first paper, we imposed the subgrid scales of the Rome to belong to the form space, but uh, this was not um, efficient. Uh, I have not shown that, but orthogonal of the scales perform significantly better than non-orthogonal of the scales, and also dynamics of the scales improve significantly the stability and accuracy of the uh, model with respect to the uh, quasi-static of the scales. Uh, another observation that again uh, might be, seem trivial but is important is that uh, we need L2 orthogonality of the basis and not algebraic orthogonality in the sense that. Uh, uh, in the sense given by the SVD decomposition. Again, we would like to know why petrov golurkin projection is much more robust than the Golurkin projection in nonlinear problems. 
Uh, the, uh, the analysis, uh, the numerical analysis of the uh, BMS ROM POD base depend, depends sol solely on the approximation properties of the POD, but that's not uh, quite satisfactory at the, at the moment. So in fact, uh, what I would like to know now is how to bound the approximation error of the POD. Of course, there are lots of papers about that, but uh, uh, I would like to have one particularly suited for uh, the problems that we have. And uh, the final remark is that uh, the correction that we propose to model, to, to improve the accuracy of the reduced order model, models based on uh, artificial neural networks uh, seems to be uh, very, very powerful. So those are a few papers that we have uh, published on the topic. The summary of the variational formulation is uh, presented in the first uh, paper that we published uh, three years ago. Um, then uh, the use of correcting corrective terms uh, using artificial neural networks was, was introduced in the uh, second paper. Then we also proposed a way to design a posterior error estimates in the third uh, paper. And the two last papers are applications of that correction based on neural networks that I have explained. One applied to the coarsening of uh, fines of fine meshes or fine time discretization, and the other applied to the to reduce torrent models. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very, very nice talk. So now it's question time. If you have question, basically you can unmute yourself, raise your hands, and you can ask directly to the speaker some questions. Let's see if from the audience there are questions. Okay. Trajan, please. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Very nice talk, uh, Ramon. I have uh, lots of questions actually, uh, but let me just ask you the the first one. So, um, you said that um, you're using the same variation uh, VMS formulation at the FOM level and ROM level, which I think is is a great idea. It's model consistency, and if I understood correctly, you use the same parameters as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, very good. Now, so I understand the motivation we're doing is pretty much similar things, but um, so I like the idea, but my question is what happens, have you tried to see what happens if you don't use the same type of parameters? So if you use different parameters at the FOM and ROM level, would that? Yes, yes we have tried. No, it's not only that we have tried, but in the first paper that we published about uh, ROM, uh, that was that I haven't listed in the list of references, but was published uh, a few years earlier. We didn't use the same parameters, and okay. in fact, our uh, let me explain a bit. Our motivation to introduce neural networks was to obtain the matrix of stabilization parameters for from first from a least squares uh, adjust adjustment. And later from uh, a, a, an artificial neural network fitting. So, and, and later we realized this is one of the conclusions of uh, Ricardo's thesis that I mentioned uh, before and that is uh, uh, contained in the paper, in the first paper that I have listed, is that we have to use the same parameters as well for the ROM as for the FOM. So, that's important. Okay. Okay. And, and when you do the numerical analysis, you, which I've done recently, it is so natural. <laughs> when, you, when you do the analysis, you'll see that you really need the same parameters and you need, really need the same inverse estimates for the uh, ROM and for the phone. Okay, 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 thank you. You're welcome. Are there other questions from the audience? I have one question. Great, be good. Uh, Dr. Codina, it was really nice talk. My question is, firstly, just understood it is correct or not. You are just comparing the corrected reduced order model with the, let's say, Galarkin one. Am I right? To just obtain 
yeah. this corrected one, you are using artificial neural network. And okay. my question, you find that this corrected term, uh, did you use any other methods, for example, did you use any closure term and the model it, and uh, did you compare these results with no, no, no. other models? No, no, no. There is no, no closure needed, no closure needed. So the only thing you need is to design this correction D, this is a function of the number of inputs, okay, you see. This is, mm -hmm. a this is a function of you see. And the only thing you need is a set of snapshots so that at the time steps in which you know the snapshots, you impose your solution to mm -hmm. be as close as possible to the exact to the exact one, meaning that the, the optimal one is the projection of the fine solution. So if you have only one, so if you have only one time step, that would be, you know, D would be directly the X, the exact solution. So you have N uh, configurations and you impose that the model, that this is a fitting, it's just a fitting, just a fitting. Mm -hmm but using an artificial neural network. There is no closure at all. And the fit, and we use this training set, so the, the solutions with which we train the neural network are the snapshots because we have them at our disposal. We have used the snapshots for the construction of the POD basis, and we can reuse them to correct the, the model. Okay, I see, thanks. Are there questions? Ryan? So I have another question. Sorry, uh, Ramon. I have. Oh, no. It's a pleasure. <laughs> so, so um, I mean, this is something that I've wanted to, to, to ask you. So, you said the inverse estimates that you're using are, if I understood correctly, are the finite element inverse estimates because the POD space, the ROM space, is a subspace of the. Exactly, of exactly. exactly. So I agree with this. I think that this is this is fair. But in principle, maybe I'm missing something, but in principle, so one could also use inverse estimates in the ROM space. Yes. But how do I, I mean, yes, of course. But um, yes, but uh, the, the, the reduced order model functions are piecewise polynomials in the same element domains as the finite element functions. And it's there where you know how to apply the inverse estimate, because there in these local elements is where you know the polynomial order and you know the mesh size. I completely agree with you. So in fact, so with the Volker, Volker Jan, um, we looked at SUPG and we tried to find the stabilization parameters using inverse estimates in the finite element space and in the ROM space. And actually the best results were with the inverse estimates in the finite element space like you used. Okay. So, okay. It's great, I, I, I'm not aware of your work. Is it published? Yeah, yeah, so this is a 2015 Kamami paper. Oh. I, was expect, I was expecting the ROM, I have to be honest that the ROM estimates to work better, but in fact, the finite element error estimates yielded better results. I, that's, that's I'll take a look at the paper. So uh, the way we went, uh, we finally uh, arrived to this conclusion is, as I said, first that we checked that the best was to use uh, the finite element parameters in practice, in practice. And later in the numerical analysis, everything came out very naturally. Right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So maybe can I ask uh, actually a question? So um, I'm really impressed about the results of the neural networks. Uh, also because you basically said that you use the shallow neural network, so like uh, a quite normal one, let's say. Uh, I was wondering if you comment a little bit on how much time do you need to train something like that and no, this is very, very little. Okay. So I, I don't have the numbers, but this is insignificant compared to the full order model. So and, uh, those those are, uh, I mean, 
I don't have the the numbers in my head, but uh, okay. it's very little. So and my uh, follow up question is like. Uh, here you have only the time advancing, right? So you are working with a fixed Reynolds number, so fixed parameter. Do, do you think that basically this can be generalized to yes, yes, the model have. where basically yes. you are moving also the Reynolds and so? Yes, yes, yes. We, we have also tested that. I mean, ah, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. And, and in fact, um, uh, the student that is working in this uh, topic, uh, Zulki, uh, is... Uh, is applying that to, to shape optimization. So it's uh, changing not only the Reynolds number, but also the, the shape of the domain. Okay. That's the objective. Our objective is to apply this idea to shape optimization, yes. Okay, cool. Because, I mean, I was really impressed about, let's say, the robustness in time, you know? So in time yes. extrapolation, you see that basically there is like- Yes, we are quite satisfied with that, yes. Yeah, and while for the non, the, the, let's say the non, regularized model you have like the increasing in magnitude and yeah. i was wondering if in the stability uh let's say in the stuff in the stability the estimates that you had for the vms structure that you showed you saw something like that that depends on time for example so that basically yes. you know okay so yeah that, that, that's a good point it might be because I, in fact i have normalized if you look at the error estimates i have normalized them with time to make explicit that the uh, that those stability estimates can deteriorate for uh, large time intervals, you know that's why I have yeah. well not in fact it's important to see them in the norms. You see in the yes, okay. you, you, the L two control for example is lost when t goes to infinity. So yeah. I don't know if that might be related to the to this possible. Uh, I, I don't think so. I think that what will happen is that uh, we, we haven't checked that, but I think that it will remain bounded. The, the ROM solution will remain bounded, although quite far away from the FOM solution. Okay. 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 Thank you very much. So are there other questions for Professor Codina from the audience? It looks, I mean, it is not the case. So we can thank one, once again, thank you very Professor much. Codina. And uh, we see each other to the next Excellent. talk next Tuesday. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.